say that works. Spread yourself as far out as you can. Okay. How are you doing? Good. Yes. Almost done. Only I've got better. Uh, uh, I've got ones that just sit on my glasses. So that's oh, that's fine. Really oh, they're really good. They're the ones that better I'll just use this. Really light. In some ways, I forget I even have. people in down there. And does, if Dr. Parks is introducing, where does she talk? Right there. Okay. Yeah. That works. I know, I saw that. I was like, thank God I charged my Fitbit. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, that clock will be, I'll use that one. Not working. tweeted it on Friday yeah. morning and 5,823 oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Holy smokes. Oh. Yeah. It's great. It was a good talk. Oh, thanks. It was just like... I'm going to do that on your call. Um, it. Okay, well... With this the webinar, right? Yeah, the hybrid thing. I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. Well, I've never done a national webinar. Oh, yeah, I got to co chair one with the physiological society. It was like a really good. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that's fun. Colleagues. Oh. <laughs> Especially being the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Good. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, th I think we'll get started. 
Um, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Parks. I'm in the Department of Nutrition and Exercise Physiology at the University of Missouri. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Mary Moore today. Uh, her mentor, Dr. Rector, is online here somewhere. Um, Mary received her BS in Sports Science and Health, uh, graduating with honors from the Dublin City University in Ireland. In 2015, she came to the Central Michigan University to complete a master's degree in exercise physiology. Following this, she completed an internship in cardiac rehab at Henry Ford Medical Center in Detroit. Professionally, Mary is ACSM certified as a clinical exercise physiologist and uh, by the American uh, Heart Association certified in first responders training. Since 2017, Mary has been a doctoral student in the laboratory of Scott Richter. In addition to conducting the research we'll hear about today, she's taught techniques and mentored graduate students and undergraduate students. And for this, my lab mates and I have been very appreciative. She's a real team player, and we know that academic life involves service. And Mary has served her discipline through leadership in the Exercises Medicine Initiative, the Graduate Professional Council, and the NEP Graduate Student Association. She was also chosen to be the graduate representative on the Chancellor's Standing Committee on the Status of Women on Campus. Mary has been the recipient of numerous honors, including many poster and travel awards, the Ben Landre and Tom Thomas Award for Outstanding Graduate Student in Exercise Physiology, and the MU School of Medicine Dean's Award for Research for her abstract at Health Sciences Research Day. Mary has published 10 papers and has many manuscripts in preparation. I am a co-investigator with Dr. Rector on a project investigating the effect of diet and exercise on liver function in patients with NAFL. And Mary has contributed significantly by coordinating the exercise training component of our nine-month treatment program. And many of the patients have told me spontaneously how much they value having her there. It's you've made a real difference. A quote from Dr. Richter, who is currently online. Mary is the hardest working graduate student I have been fortunate enough to train. And I am excited to see what her future holds in <laughs> academic research. Her dual training in animal and human studies puts her in an excellent position to be a leader in the field of exercise physiology. We're fortunate to have some of you here in the room today, and please uh, help me welcome Mary Moore. Can everybody hear me on the mic? OK. Uh, I think we should finish the talk here, finish, finish on a high. No. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk today. Um, welcome to those in the room and welcome to those on Zoom University online. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the impact of nutrition and ketosis on hepatic outcomes. Um, is this working? No. It was working earlier. Okay. Okay. Got it. I enter on the computer too. Sometimes there's a delay. Won't escape come back in. My computer looks like it's frozen. Okay. There it is. Something's working. Okay. So my talk's gonna be broken up into two main parts. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the background of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and a little bit of background on nutrition and ketosis and what that is. And then I'm going to talk about uh, a ketogenic diet feeding and its effects on hepatic outcomes, and then also dietary ketone ester feeding and its uh, effect on hepatic outcomes. Um, first of all, to start with just a couple of disclosures for fun. Um, I don't follow a ketogenic diet, nor do I uh, consume exogenous ketone supplements. Um, however, I do try to limit processed foods and refined carbohydrates. Um, however, I do eat a lot of chocolate, and this is always to excess. Um, and because I'm going to talk about a little bit about exercise today, I do enjoy uh, exercising regularly, and I'm already a bit biased because my PhD is going to be in that. So, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFL as I'm going to refer to it, um, is a spectrum of disease and starts off with steatosis or fat, a buildup of fat in the liver. And this is called fatty liver, and it's about, uh, about 25 to 30% of the US population are thought to have fatty liver disease. 
As fatty liver disease progresses, it can progress to NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And this is the presence of inflammation and fat in the liver. And about 20% of those with a fatty liver are at risk of developing NASH. If NASH is left untreated, it then can progress with fibrosis to cirrhosis and more end-stage liver disease. Um, currently, there are no uh, drug therapies approved by the FDA to treat NAFLD. And right now, the only treatment that is, is approved is um, weight loss through diet and exercise. So some of what our lab does in the Rector Lab is we study the mechanisms by which different manipulations of diet and exercise uh, may treat or may affect the liver and then how it may be able to treat NAFLD or not. Okay, so NAFLD um, is uh, caused by multiple factors. So as multiple pathogenesis, pathogenesis disease. Um, Oftentimes it, covers, it occurs in a state of nutrient excess or overflow of nutrients back to, the, back to the liver and the liver has to work overtime in order to deal with this increased stress. And this stress can come from peripheral factors such as increases in insulin resistance at the level of the muscle and the adipose tissue which causes excess glucose and free fatty acids to flow back. And then also can be caused by dietary factors such as excess calorie intake, increase or greater fat intake and uh, carbohydrate, in particular uh, simple carbohydrate intake. And then if we look at the level of the hepatocyte, this kind of excess nutrient flux back to the liver can result in a buildup of triglycerides or lipids in the liver. And then as disease progresses a little bit further, there's increase in mitochondrial dysfunction, and there's also an increase in hepatic insulin resistance, de novo lipogenesis, which is the, uh, how the liver manufactures free fatty acids from predominantly from carbohydrate sources, and increased uh, TG release also. Then disease progresses a little bit more, more advanced NASH is associated with macrophage activation and hepatic cell at cell activation, which ultimately drives this um, this uh, histological phenotype that we see with increasing steatosis and um, in inflammation and fibrosis. Okay, so moving on to the next part, as I've mentioned, NAFLD prevalence uh, in the United States is about 25 to 30 percent. And it, this is on par with the global prevalence, which is also about 25 percent. And NAFLD also occurs, occurs in the presence of a number of other comorbidities or corresponds with a number of other comorbidities, which includes obesity, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. So with this increasing prevalence of NAFLD and its association with a number of other comorbidities, it's important that we try and figure out different uh, approaches in order to try and treat the disease. And one of these ways might be through nutritional ketosis. So just kind of a quick background on ketosis and what it is. Uh, ketones were first discovered in the urine of patients with uncontrolled diabetes back in the 18, uh, 1850s. And since then, there's been a huge amount of research done, particularly as it relates to epilepsy and type 1 diabetes, and how ketogenic diet feeding and fasting-induced ketosis can be used to treat and those diseases. More recently, in the last decade or two, there's been a resurgence in the interest of uh, nutritional ketosis um, to treat a number of other metabolic diseases and also to promote, or to promote sports performance um, and combat performance as well. And so kind of just to go through, first of all, because I'm going to talk about a ketogenic diet first, I'm going to go quickly go over uh, endogenous ketogenesis. So Endogenous ketogenesis must occur in a state of high free fatty acid availability and low carbohydrate availability. And what this allows um, to occur in the liver is uh, an increase in beta oxidation or fatty acid oxidation. And those excess acetylcholines that come from fatty acid oxidation are then funneled into the uh, ketogenic pathway, resulting in the production of ketone bodies. And then the hepatocyte itself actually cannot oxidize ketone bodies for fuel, so they have to be exported to extrahepatic tissues and extrahepatic cells in order to be used. There's two main types of ketone bodies that our body produces, and this includes beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHB, and then acetoacetate, or ACAC, which they'll be referred to as in the rest of the presentation. And then, uh, as I've mentioned, there's a couple of roles for ketone bodies, the first one being uh, fuel, uh, fuel utilization. They also have direct signaling properties. And then some recent research is coming out to show that once ketone bodies are oxidized, their metabolites uh, can also have some signaling properties, which is a little bit interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, therapeutic ketosis applications, there's strong evidence for its use in epilepsy, neurological disorders, and type 1 diabetes. 
wherever there's emerging evidence for its use in, in inborn errors of metabolism, cancer, and then also uh, to treat metabolic diseases related to obesity. So it can be used to treat weight loss or promote weight loss and weight management. Uh, type 2 diabetes and NAFLD. However, there's a gap, in the, although this is being promoted um, to treat med these metabolic diseases, there's a gap in the literature as to what its Im impacts are, and there's very little known about its impacts on hepatic, on hepatic outcomes also. Sorry. Okay, so that brings me to my first uh, study that I'm going to do, which is the impact of ketogenic diet feeding on hepatic outcomes. And so what exactly is a ketogenic diet? So as I mentioned before, ketogenic diet feeding must occur in the presence of high free fatty acid availability and low carbohydrate availability. So by default, a ketogenic diet is made up predominantly of fat, so it's about 75 to 90 percent fat. Then it's followed by protein, which is about 10 to 15 percent usually. And there's all, then there's very little or almost no carbohydrates in the diet. I'm just going to throw this graph up here. I think it's kind of a nice summary of all the different diets that we often hear about that are reported to have health promoting benefits for uh, in healthy people and also in uh, metabolic disease. And we can kind of see if we look down here, ketogenic diet, it's one of the ones that are, is much lower in protein and carbohydrate and much higher in fat. And it's, uh, so it's quite harder to uh, adhere to. Okay, so what are some of the uh, reported um, health benefits of ketogenic diet in the, of ketogenic diet feeding in the, in the liver that's currently published? Uh, ketogenic diet feeding has been shown to improve glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity, and it's also been shown to uh, reduce hepatic de novo lipogenesis. And then ketogenic diet feeding has also been shown to uh, improve mitochondrial function and antioxidant, antioxidant defense systems, and this has been shown in the brain and not so much in the liver. So there's very few studies, however, that have looked at the effect of ketogenic diet feeding uh, with exercise and what it, what it impacts on hepatic outcomes. To our knowledge, there's been one study done by Mike Roberts' group down in the University of Arkansas, where he looked at the effects of exercise on a ketogenic diet on a number of metabolic tissues, one of these being the liver. And what he did was, what, what he did was uh, take uh, rats and he randomized them either to a resistance exercise group or a sedentary control group. And then he gave them access to either a standard chow diet a Western diet or a ketogenic diet. And this is a bit more of a moderate ketogenic diet than what I've seen before in, rodent, in the rodent literature. It's about 70% fat, 20% protein, and 10% carbohydrate. And what he showed, or they showed, sorry, um, despite the, uh, whether they exercised or not, these rats showed an improvement in serum glucose and lipid homeostasis and a reduction in hepatic oxidative stress with ketogenic diet feeding. And so with this uh, study, we wanted to know what were the effects of... Um, a ketogenic diet in the presence of aerobic exercise. So that brings me to my first study where we studied the physiological impact of ketogenic diet and markers of hepatic metabolism in the presence of aerobic exercise. And we also looked at this uh, in uh, males versus females as well. And this study was done in conjunction uh, with no, no one else except uh, Frank Booth, or none other than Frank Booth, and uh, Taylor Kelty is PhD student. Um, and so what our study design is, we took male and female Worcester rats and we randomized them to three uh, dietary groups. The first one being a standard chai group, which is just, this is just a classic low fat diet, a Western group, a Western diet fed group, which, is, uh, which consisted of 40% fat and about 40% carbohydrate. And so this is a high fat, high sucrose diet that also has some cholesterol in it. And this is a diet that's classically used in order to induce metabolic disease in rodents. And then finally, we also randomized animals to a ketogenic diet, which was about 90% fat and 9% protein, and then uh, almost little to no carbohydrate. And all animals in this study were given access to a voluntary wheel run, uh, a voluntary running wheel, sorry. Um, so there's no sedentary groups in this study. So animals remained in these diet and exercise conditions for uh, seven weeks before being the tissue, tissue collection. Okay. So we're going to look at uh, body composition outcomes first, and just to orientate you to the graph, the black bars are standard chow-fed animals, gray bars are western diet-fed animals, and then the yellow or gold bar is uh, ketogenic diet-fed animals. And on the left, we have the males, and on the right, in the, pa in the stripe patterns, we have the females. And then significant different symbols are indicated in the little box on the left-hand corner of the screen. 
Um, so in terms of uh, mean change in body mass over the course of the study, Western diet and ketogenic diet fed males tended to gain a little bit less weight. This wasn't really an effect of the diets, but more so the uh, Western diet and ketogenic diet fed males just tended to be a little bit heavier at the start of the study um, uh, at the time of randomization. So it's not really, I don't really think it's an effect of the diet and then there's no effect of diet in the females. However, if you look at body fat percentage, we can see that um, similar to a Western diet, ketogenic diet feeding increased um, body fat percentage relative to standard chow fed animals in both males and females. But the interesting thing is that if you look at the females, you can see females on a ketogenic diet um, gained significantly less body fat versus the Western diet fed animals. And we don't really know why this is. We didn't really look into it in this study, but it may be driven by hormonal effects. There may also be uh, factors such as increased thermogenesis resulting in increased energy expenditure that cause this difference. Moving on from this then, the first thing I kind of want to look at um, uh, in terms of hepatic outcomes was, uh, what did a ketogenic diet plus exercise do to oxidative stress? And so, uh, glutathione, the glutathione pathway is um, one such pathway that it, uh, the cell can use in order to deal with uh, oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species production in the cell. And so uh, reduced GSH or reduced glutathione can react with ROS in the cell to neutralize it to H2O. And then in the process of this, GSH is uh, converted to oxidized glutathione, a DSSG. And GPX1 or glutathione peroxidase 1 is required for this process. What we showed in our animals was that in both males and females, there was a significant reduction in oxidized glutathione or GSSG with ketogenic diet feeding. Similarly, we also saw a significant increase in protein content of, G of GPX1 in the liver of these animals. So what this suggested to us was that there was an increased capacity for oxidative stress maybe in the presence of, keto of a ketogenic diet in both males and females. Then to kind of tease out the story a little bit more, we looked at NERF2. And NERF2 is a major uh, transcription regulator of oxidative stress in the cell. And it, when it's activated by ROS in the cell, it translocates to the nucleus and results in, in, results in up, transcription upregulation of a number of factors associated with oxidative stress. So what happened to, to NERF2 in these animals? If I bring your attention to the males, we can see that NERF2, result, or NERF2 was significantly lower in animals fed a ketogenic diet in the male groups relative to the standard chow fed controls, again, suggesting to us that there may just be reduced oxidative stress in these animals when they're on a ketogenic diet. No different than in the females, however, again, females just tended to have overall lower NERF2 levels uh, versus the males, so maybe they have less oxidative stress overall, regardless of the diet. Progressing on from this then, we looked at hepatic triglyceride content um, in the liver of these animals. And what we saw was hepatic triglyceride content is going to be my indicator of the degree of steatosis in these animals. And what we saw was that ketogenic diet feeding, similar to a Western diet, resulted in a significant increase in triglyceride content in the livers of uh, these animals. Um, there's no difference in between Western diet and ketogenic diet feeding for the, for the males. However, if you look at the females, we can see again that ketogenic diet feeding uh, fed females had lower triglyceride content in the liver versus Western diet fed uh, females. And again, we don't really know why this is. It's an interesting sex effect and it may again be driven by hormonal factors. <clears throat> Keeping on this uh, tone of lipids and lipogenesis, the next step was to look at markers of hepatic lipogenesis or de novo lipogenesis in the livers of these animals. And de novo lipogenesis is the process by which um, the liver makes uh, lipids or fatty acids, um, mainly from carbohydrate sources, and it's regulated by uh, acetyl-CoA carboxylase or ACC and fatty acid synthase. And uh, so in terms of ACC, if I just bring your attention, first of all, to the images at the bottom of the graph, we can see that ACC and phosphorylated ACC was significantly downregulated in the ketogenic diet fed males and females relative to Western diet. And, Western diet and standard chow fed animals. And so what we do is phospho ACC is an indication that the lipogenesis pathway is being downregulated. So when we get the ratio of phospho ACC and ACC, we can see here that it's significantly upregulated. And this is indicative of a, of a deactivation of this pathway. So there's less lipogenesis occurring in the setting of a ketogenic diet. And then if we look further down the pathway, we look at fatty acid synthase, we can see again that 
ketogenic diet feeding of both the males and the females almost completely abrogated fatty acid synthase protein content in the liver relative to Western diet and standard chow fed animals. So what this is suggesting to us is that keep in mind that a ketogenic diet is uh, very, very low in carbohydrate or it has almost no carbohydrates. So maybe the stimulus uh, of the carbohydrates, to, sorry, to promote uh, the novel lipogenesis in the liver um, is, is being removed here in this, in this setting. Moving on from this then, another factor that's important um, in terms of hepatic health is uh, mitochondrial content or mass. Um, one surrogate measure of mitochondrial mass that we use in, the, in, the, in our lab is citrate synthase activity. And what we show here is that both ketogenic diet feeding and western diet feeding resulted in a significant increase in mitochondrial mass relative to the standard chow fed animals in both males and females. Similarly, if we look at cytochrome C protein content, another marker of mitochondrial mass or content, we see a significant upregulation in ketogenic diet fed animals versus Western diet or versus standard chow fed animals. And this is mainly driven by the males, as we can see on the screen. So, my, increases in mitochondrial mass uh, may be driven by mitochondrial biogenesis. So, it's important for the liver or the cell to turn over the mitochondria to keep producing new healthy ones in order to maintain the health of the cell. So the next step for me was to look at mitochondrial biogenesis. Mitochondrial biogenesis is driven by PGC1-alpha and TFAM. They're the, both, uh, the two main uh, transcription regulators, or two of the major transcription regulators of mitochondrial biogenesis. And their upregulation is associated with the uh, increase in, in uh, the production of new mitochondria in the cell. And what we showed here was that if we look at PG PGC one off at first, we can see ketogenic diet feeding in both the males and the females resulted in a significant increase in PGC one alpha protein content um, in, the, in these livers uh, relative to both the Western diet and the standard chow fed animals. Similarly, we also saw an increase in TFAM protein content with ketogenic diet feeding. However, we also saw a significant increase in the Western diet fed animals. And so um, right now, the literature, whether ketogenic diet feeding in the literature, whether ketogenic diet feeding increases mitochondrial biogenesis, um, it's a little bit mixed as to whether it does or not. Some people say it does, some people say it doesn't affect it, but these animals were also exercising. So whether it's a synergistic effect of both exercise and ketogenic diet that's causing this effect, I don't really know. And we probably need, would need a, a sedentary control in order just to tease that out a little bit more. And so with that, I'm going to conclude... Um, my first study that I've done. Um, so ketogenic diet feeding in the presence of exercise resulted in an increase in hepatic oxidative stress capacity. It also decreased hepatic lipogenesis and it also resulted in an increase in hepatic mitochondria content and uh, biogenesis. And overall, aside from uh, the, uh, the body composition stuff, uh, males and females appear to uh, respond similarly. So moving on to my next part, we're going to talk about the impact of dietary ketone ester feeding on hepatic outcomes. And so recently, uh, ketone esters or ketone supplements, sorry, have uh, uh, garnered a reputation as a magic bullet for to promote metabolic health. Um, <clears throat> however, there is a lack of research to support its use, uh, particularly in metabolic diseases. And so there's three main uh, types of ketone supplements or exogenous ketone supplements that you can get right now or that are being studied also. And these include medium chain triglycerides, ketone salts, and then ketone esters. Um, and I'm going to talk about a particular ketone ester today in the study I'm going to present. Is it going to advance? Okay. And so just to kind of compare quickly endogenous ketogenesis versus exogenous. So endogenous is what we just talked about. It often occurs uh, in the presence of car carbohydrate restriction and there's high free fatty acid availability. However, with exogenous ketone, uh, ketogenesis, which is when you consume a ketone supplement, it's rapid in onset, so it occurs immediately after you consume the product. Uh, there's no need for carbohydrate restriction. And then also it's actually ketone esters or ketone supplements are actually anti-lipolytic, so there, it occurs in, uh, in the presence of low free fatty acid availability, which is kind of interesting, it's kind of flipped. And so this is, uh, this graph just kind of, or this uh, slide just kind of shows uh, the many mechanisms by which ketone bodies are, um, have been shown to signal within the body. And I think ketone supplements or ketone esters gives a nice um, 
give us a nice opportunity to be able to study uh, these potential mechanisms in a carbohydrate replete state. So it's almost like it's a, a therapeutic mechanism, which is kind of nice. Okay, so what are some of the purported, uh, or what are some of the findings in the current li literature in terms of uh, ketone ester uh, supplementation and its impacts on, on metabolic health? Um, it's been shown to decrease uh, glucose levels, circulating glucose levels, decrease free fatty acid levels, or decrease lipolysis. It's also uh, been shown to have an anti-inflammatory role. And long-term keto keto ketone ester feeding has been shown to increase weight loss and promote brain adipose tissue thermogenesis. However, there's very little or almost no um, re or data as to what does a ketone ester do to the liver. Um, so... Recently, um, ketone ester oxidation or metabolism has been linked um, to a reduction in fibrosis in the liver. And so when I uh, got the opportunity to study nutritional ketosis using a ketone ester, um, I wanted to look at kind of the fibrogenic pathway in the liver. So this is just kind of to uh, give a quick overview of what's the pr process of fibrosis in the liver. Fibrosis is driven by hepatic cell at cell activation in the liver, and this is caused by increasing lipotoxicity in the hepatocyte and also M1 um, pro-inflammatory activation. This results in hepatic cell at cell activation, which can then drive fibrogenesis, fibrosis, and tissue remodeling in the, in the liver. And this is really what con contributes to the advancing of NASH. And so one paper, one, a recent paper back in 2019 from Peter Crawford's group showed that uh, the oxidation of ketone esters, in particular acetoacetate in the macrophage, is required um, to prevent the activation of hepatic stellate cells. And it was this uh, ketone oxidation in the macrophage was associated with an M2 macrophage phenotype, so an anti inflammatory phenotype, and a reduction in hepatic stellate cell activation and fi the fibrogenic response, which is kind of interesting. So, with that, we wanted to look at. Um, the physiological impact of exogenous ketone ester feeding on markers of hepatic inflammation and fibrogenesis. And this study was done in conjunction with uh, Dr. Eric Plaisant down at uh, UAB and his uh, PhD student and postdoc. And so for our experimental design, we took uh, C57 male mice and we high fat diet fed them for 10 weeks to induce obesity and NAFLD. And then following these 10 weeks, animals were randomized into three groups. So it was either a control group in which the animals were maintained in a high fat diet, um, or a ketone ester group in which 30% of their energy in their diet uh, was replaced with a ketone ester. And this is the ketone ester over here on the right hand side of the slide. So this ketone ester is a butane diol diacetoacetate. And it's, it has a beta hydroxybutyrate backbone and it's diester with two acetoacetates. And so one um, issue with ketone esters when they're consumed, um, oftentimes when they're brought to the liver to be cleaved, it results in the production of an alcohol molecule. And then that alcohol molecule can be potentially damaging to the liver. However, this, this ketone ester is novel because when it's brought to the liver, it, when it's cleaved and it forms two beta hydroxybutyrates and an acetoacetate and no alcohol molecule is uh, produced. So it's a little bit more protective. And then the ketone ester fed group tended to eat less than the control fed animals. So we included a pair of fed group here where they were maintained on a high fat diet, but their calorie intake was matched to that of the ketone ester group. And then once animals are randomized to these three dietary groups, they were maintained in these conditions for 12 weeks. And so uh, just to orientate you to the graph, the black bar is control fed animals, uh, the pair of fed group is the blue or purple bars. I may also refer to these as, as the weight loss group. Um, and then the ketone ester fed group is the yellow or gold bars. And then the significant differences um, are indicated by different letters. And it's just a reminder in the bottom left-hand corner if anybody wants to look. Okay, so the energy intake, in terms of energy intake, ketone fed, ester fed animals tended to eat about 26% less ca uh, calories versus the control fed animals. So the pair fed animals were matched to this. If we look at body composition outcomes, we can see that uh, ketone ester feeding resulted in a significant reduction in body mass and in fat mass. And this reduction was beyond that observed in the parafed group or the weight loss group alone, which is quite interesting. And then what uh, 
I looked at first was what did ketone ester feeding do to the NAFLD phenotype? So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, is scored histologically based on the degree of steatosis that's in the liver indicated by the circles on the screen. You can see this buildup of uh, little lipid, white lipid droplets in the tissue and then also the degree of uh, inflammation and ballooning that can occur in the liver. And this is indicated by the arrows. There's clustering of macrophages in the liver tissue. And then you, what you can do is you can take this and you can score it and it gives us a score based on steatosis, inflammation and ballooning. And if you look in the graph, you can see that, again, ketone ester feeding resulted in a significant reduction in steatosis and inflammation scores relative to the parafed and the control groups. And then parafeeding and ketone ester feeding resulted in or similar reductions in, in ballooning. And so what we can do is take these three scores and we tally them and this gives us the NAFL activity score which uh, kind of it tells us or indicates to us the degree of disease that's present in the liver. And you can see the ketone ester feeding resulted in a significant decrease in NAFL activity score of these animals relative to the parafed group and the control fed group. And so this is quite interesting. If I remind you, currently weight loss is the only uh, FDA approved therapeutic treatment for NAFL. So to see this additional effect of the ketone ester, is this the one? Yeah. ketone ester um, is quite interesting. And so then because ketone ester uh, oxidation is, uh, may play a potential role in fibrosis, the next step was to look at histological fibrosis. And if I just bring your attention to the graph on the right-hand side of the screen, um, fibrosis scores were significantly lower in the ketone ester fed group relative to the parafed and the control fed animals, which is quite nice. Moving on from this, the next logical step was to look at markers of hepatic fibrosis and fibrogenesis in the liver to complement this, uh, this histological outcomes. And so this is just a, the diagram is just a reminder of what I've gone through before. Um, um, the first thing I looked at was uh, hepatic fibrosis markers and alpha smooth muscle actin and COL1A1 are two main uh, markers that we would look at. Um, so as you can see, alpha smooth muscle actin was significantly lowered in the ketone ester fed group relative to the parafed and control animals. And we didn't see any improvements with weight loss alone in the parafed group. It's quite interesting. And then for COL1A1, we didn't see any differences across uh, any of the dietary groups. Looking a little bit further down the fibrogenesis pathway, we then looked at um, PDG, PDGF beta and MMP9, which is, was significantly downregulated in the ketone ester fed animals relative to the, to the high fat diet fed controls. However, there was no differences between the parafed and ketone, fed, and ketone ester fed animals, but you can see it's trending down. Okay, and so because then uh, ketone esters have been shown to also, or ketone oxidation in the liver has been shown to promote an anti-inflammatory phenotype, the next thing I did was look at inflammation. And so um, this is just a very superficial summary of uh, macrophage phenotypes. And uh, macrophages often um, are expressed in an M2 phenotype or, uh, which is immunomodulatory and it's immune suppressive and it promotes tissue repair. So it's kind of anti-inflammatory versus M1 uh, macrophage phenotype, which uh, is a pro-inflammatory phenotype. And this is macrophages are often M1 activated in the setting of NAFLD or NASH. It promotes cytotoxicity and tissue injury can drive uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. And so when we looked at these animals, um, we, were, we saw, I first looked at markers of uh, macrophage content within the liver. So this doesn't really tell us whether they're M1 or M2, but just the, how much macrophages are actually there. And there was no significant differences really between the groups in terms of macrophage content. However, when I measured markers of M2 uh, macrophages in the cell, which is CD6, uh, CD163, which is uh, shown to play an anti-inflammatory role um, in the cell, uh, CD163 was significantly upregulated in the ketone ester fed group um, relative to the parafed and control fed animals. Um, and I, I've, I haven't put up the uh, M1 macrophage markers here just for uh, simplicity, but there was no differences between those. Um, so it just kind of made it cleaner if I did this. Okay, so looking at a couple of other inflammatory pathways, uh, I first of all looked at CCN1, which is a matrix protein that promotes uh, apoptosis and pro-inflammatory uh, and inflammation in, in NAFLD and NASH, and it's been shown to be upregulated in, in NAFLD in humans and in animals. And it was significantly reduced with ketone ester feeding, and there was no, no effect of weight loss alone on, um, 
on CCN1. I also looked at TRAIL1, which is another pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic marker. Um, and it was significantly reduced with both pear feeding and ketone ester feeding, but you can appreciate that ketone ester feeding resulted in a reduction in trail beyond that observed with weight loss alone. And CCN1 has been shown to uh, potentially regulate trail. And whether ketone ester feeding um, or the ketone esters themselves are uh, interrupting this pro inflammatory pathway would be an interesting hypothesis, but more research is needed in order to tease this out. Okay. And so with that, I'm going to conclude this study. Um, so dietary ketone ester feeding with this butane diol diacetoacetate results in a reduction in markers of fibrosis and fibrogenesis, a reduction in markers of inflammation, and an increase in an M2 phenotype as well. And then also a reduction in uh, overall NAFL severity. So future studies are needed in order to tease out the exact mechanisms that ketone ester consumption is doing to the liver. And so to conclude overall, what can we confer? Can we confer that nutrition and ketosis is beneficial for, for the liver? And the answer is yes and no, and, and but maybe. So um, ketogenic diet feeding with exercise provides beneficial effects on oxidative stress capacity and hepatic lipogenesis and markers of mitochondrial content and biogenesis. Um, however, if you remember with the ketogenic diet, it resulted in a significant increase in body fat and also in liver triglyceride content. So this was quite a short-term ketogenic diet feeding study. So if we were to put, bring these animals out longer, um, will we see similar effects or would we see detrimental effects of ketogenic diet feeding? That re remains to be explored. Um, oral ketone ester feeding provides beneficial effects on body composition, histological outcomes of NAFLD and hepatic fibrosis and inflammation as well. Um, again, however, what are the long-term benefits of ketone ester feeding in the liver? That still remains to be teased out. And then other potential signaling properties of ketone bodies remain to be explored as well. <clears throat> and then, so with that, am I going super fast? No. Um, with that, I'd like to do my acknowledgements. Uh, Dr. Rector, who couldn't be here today, he actually hasn't been in since Monday, since Rory left. He's been too upset. <laughs> I'm only, I'm only messing. He, this is probably more of an uh, accurate description of Rector, Dr. Rector. He's at home at the minute with his kids because uh, it's closed down with COVID. Uh, thanks to Grace in the lab. She's our saviour. Uh, Rory does stuff sometimes when he's here. Uh, thanks to Ryan Dashik. And then these are past members of our lab that has helped along the way. A uh, big thank you to all of our collaborators um, and our funding sources. And um, with that, I will um, take questions. So I'm looking at the chat. Great job. You must not have heard my joke. <laughs> I have a question to start off. Um, you added the ketone esters to replace some of the energy of the diet. What did you remove that you replaced? Uh, predominantly the sucrose. So I have a makeup of the of the diet if you want to see it. But it was predominantly uh, the sucrose that we removed from the. Oh, this is, um, whew. She has a little bit more data than she showed us. These are just, <laughs> these are some, oh, there we go. So these are, um, it was predominantly, if we look here, it's mostly the sucrose that we actually removed if you compare it to the control fed animals. So that is a little bit of a caveat. We left that sucrose um, uh, kind of insult in the control fed animals. So whether, if we had have, uh, done a better job of kind of matching the sucrose content of the, of the diet, we may be able to tease our, or kind of remove that variable of like taking out the sucrose insult. Yeah, with macronutrients, you've got to get rid of one to add another. Um, yeah. yeah, it's difficult. Um, and then your uh, liver fat content was, I think, something like 20 milligrams per gram. So that's still only... Liver, I mean, was that a low amount of liver fat, even in the high-fat sucrose-fed animals? Um, yeah, I think it still was a, li it was a little bit low. And the, all these animals are exercising, so that probably kept it a little bit low. So everything is kind of relative just to the standard chai-fed controls. So that's, again, another caveat of the ketogenic that's diet feeding. Really beautiful Any questions? Do you have any on there? Sorry? Do you have any on there? Uh, yeah, Jim, you can shoot your question in if you want while I look. Effect of going on the diet. 
due to the increased calorie, can, I'm going to read it out. So can you please comment on the yo-yo effect of going on and off the diet? Oops, they're coming in too fast now. Uh, due to the increased calorie count in the keto diet, wouldn't that increase the number of adipocytes uh, while increasing the size? Um, I'm not really sure if we can tease that out here. The, as, a, uh, as a result of the ketogenic diet being higher in calories, that the rats just tend to eat less of it. And um, it wasn't that they uh, ate more. But... Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure about the OEO effect. It would be interesting to do that study in like a rodent model and then try and translate it to humans. I do know that humans can go on and off ketogenic. They're telling you I'm ketogenic, but are they really? I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, James, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. Oh, uh, sorry. Thanks, Dr. Job. Thanks. Uh, super informative. I guess one of the conclusions that you came to study was overall was like there was reduced oxidative stress. I guess I was just wondering, like, did you how did you test that reduced oxidative stress? Did you do like a cross assay or something? I didn't see any graph representing that. Um we did I did a couple of assays. Um there was no effect, but then the G the GSH, GSSG, that was an assay, so it was actually kind of testing the activity of those. So and um, that's kind of where we conferred it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to switch to Zoom now, and then whoever's at the back there, I'll come to you. Uh, so Dr. Fritchie is going to have a question on diet. Okay, so what do you, uh, you think your diets are doing to the gut microbiome? Do you consider collecting and analyzing fecal samples for microbiome profiles? Thank you, Dr. Fritchie. I'm going to go to the, uh, to the ketone ester diet. I'm not quite sure what it's doing to the gut microbiome. It did cause um, an increase in fecal, um, an increase in the amount of uh, fecal load or the amount of uh, the animals were pooping. So I think it may have caused a little bit of uh, increased gut stress and whether that's potentially changing the gut microbiome, it probably is, but it hasn't been looked into in our study. Uh, I hope that answers some of your question. Um, do I have any others? I don't think so. So there's two people at the back. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, can um, how can you put this into clinical context in terms of uh, putting in a person with NAFLD on a on a ketogenic diet? And the answer for me to that is, I don't know whether long term a ketogenic diet is beneficial for somebody with NAFLD. Um, there's some case studies in the literature to show that it is beneficial. Again, they didn't really use good measures of whether they were still in ketosis or not. Then there's been other case studies also that show that a ketogenic diet actually wasn't beneficial and it caused some damage. So it may be highly individual. Um, I think maybe short term, it could, if somebody wants to be really compliant, it could be useful because it promotes, I mean, when people are on a keto diet or just a low carb diet, like a Atkins diet or something, they do lose weight. Um, and they do lose, uh, decrease their uh, fat content in their liver because a lot of times they take out all of the sugary carbohydrates that they're consuming. Um, so my answer to that is I don't know. Uh, and, there's, and the clinical literature is still very mixed in it as well. Actually, we actually just published a review article on dietary, uh, topic, like topical dietary um, di different diets like paleo diet, ketogenic diet, and whether they're beneficial to humans in the setting of NAFL. Um, I can send it to you if you want. What did you conclude? From, the, from that, uh, this, yes, no, but maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, the, they all seem to be, uh, oh, is there another question? Um, based on that, a lot of times, a lot of studies um, come out to be calories is king. Um, I think there is some potential uh, uh, benefits of having like a more moderate fat, lower carbohydrate diet, and particularly if you have a Mediterranean diet where you have higher uh, healthy fats, etc. cetera. Uh, but right now it's calories are king and more research is needed. So yeah, uh, any more questions? Oh, there is. Um, that's my sister there. Okay. Uh, 
a lot of keto diet, or this is from Dusty Shea, a lot of keto diet uh, proponents say that humans will fully fat adapt and metabolically prefer ketones over glucose. Do you think this is true and do we see it in rodents? There is some stuff to show in rodents. So there is some stuff to show in rodents that ketogenic diet feeding, although it's mixed, may um, increase insulin resistance. And I'm not quite so sure, I'm not quite sure why. Nobody's really looked into the signaling mechanisms from what I've read at least. But uh, maybe when I'm thinking about it logically on a systems level, there might be these carbohydrate levels are so low, so the body might become a little bit more insulin resistant because it wants all the glucose to go to the brain, right? And then, so automatically other peripheral cells become a little bit more insulin resistant. I have heard also anecdotally, like uh, people who were on a true ketogenic diet and got like an OGTT, they were insulin resistant. However, when they went back to eating a normal, moderate amount of carbohydrates, they got their OGTT again, and they were not insulin resistant. They were like they looked healthy. So that's just kind of a little bit of anecdotal evidence, I guess. Um, any other thing? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna check the girl at the back first because you had a question at the very start, Sergeant. Uh, so for that first, where you talked about all of the nice. Um, the different diets had a running reel. Did you notice one diet means more exercise than the other? Um, overall running vo I have a slide on that. Thanks. Uh, overall running volume didn't look like it differed. Although it looks in the graph like it did a bit. So on the bottom we have males, and on then on the top in the clear we have females. Females ten female rodents tend to run more than male rodents. That's well accepted. Um. Overall, if I uh, want, I don't have the bar graph to show you, but volume was not different in these animals. So there's no significant differences between the diets. I think that was initially why Taylor was interested in this because he wanted to look at the effects of it on motivation in the brain, but there was no real, no real effect. For people that don't do road studies, if you will look at the y-axis, and that's 14 kilometers in one night, and then think what their gait size is. Tiny, yeah. one inch gate size for their friend two inch gate size. That's a lot of steps. Yeah. James? So, you know what, like, the keto of blue is? Uh, oh. like, uh, so, I guess I'm wondering, is, are animals also susceptible to that? So, if you're putting them on, like, this ketogenic diet chow, are they going to become sick? And then, if they do, help them overcome it so you don't, like, have high attrition in your. Uh, well, the can it, there's no attrition because that's the only diet they got. But, uh, but I, I do I see what you're saying. So they probably if they because they have similar physiology, right? So that's why we study them. So they probably do have a bit of a keto flu, but their metabolism is so fast that they get into ketosis a lot faster, and um, they will be in ketosis in like less than 24 hours. Whereas with humans, it takes at least 24 to 48 hours or duck parts right to like for them to switch and then that's a kind of keto flu so yeah much faster um do we have anything else here no oh, i don't think so okay that it? thanks guys no very good job thank you very much. Oh, no, yeah thank you everybody